Good evening and welcome to Church History in Plain Language. My name is Vic Carpenter and we're looking at chapter 28 in Bruce Shelley's book, Church History in Plain Language, tonight. And we will be diving into the Counter-Reformation, what is known as the, the opposing aspect of the Reformation. So the <clears throat> excuse me, Roman Catholic Church had gotten so bad during the Middle Ages that there was a Reformation which we have been talking about for maybe five weeks now. And then there developed what was called a counter-reformation. So we'll talk about that some tonight and how the Catholic Church worked to preserve itself. But just a little bit of a reminder as to where we've come from. We're 1,500 years away. Let me see if I can get this off here. I was going to. 1,500 years away from the time of Christ uh, walking this earth with his disciples. And so that far away, you've got all kinds of different things going on. We fell into great decay, uh, and then we've talked about a reformation, the desire to get back to the Scriptures and what the Scriptures taught about Jesus, people giving their lives even unto martyrdom, uh, to preach and teach what the Bible says, to work to translate the Bible so that people could read it for themselves. And it's always interesting to see the struggles and the way that the struggles develop. And to compare that to our day, 500 years beyond where we are in church history now, because we've, we're about a little over halfway through this book, and we'll have taken half of the book to get 1,500 years and the other half of the book to get 500 years. So we slow down substantially as we get closer to our time. But we struggle with all kinds of things still in our day, and we can learn from these things in the past. So let's pray for the Lord to... Give us understanding as we study these things tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you for the study of history. Thank you so much for faithful men and women in the past. Faithful men and women that have loved you, have loved the gospel of Jesus Christ, have been willing to even give up their own lives for your word. Those that have been willing to go to the far reaches of the world as missionaries to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not a salvation of works, but a salvation of grace through faith and to translate your word into the most obscure foreign languages so that people anywhere can read the Bible. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and that your word is so accessible to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so beginning tonight, we are going to start with Ignatius Loyola and what was happening in the Counter-Reformation. So Ignatius Loyola was injured uh, around 1521, which was the same year that Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses, I'm sorry, that he, was, uh, that he appeared before the Diet of Worms. So that was when he had to defend himself for his 95 theses, and he gave his famous statement of, uh, unless I am persuaded by the word of God and my conscience, then I will not recant these things, so help me God. So that same year, um, a... <clears throat> Spanish nobleman was fighting on the emperor's borderlands against the invading French in Pamploma. A cannonball shattered one of his legs, and during a long and painful convalescence, he turned out of boredom to two popular inspirational works, one of the lives of the saints and the other on the life of Christ. With these, with, with these his long process of conversion began. Months later, at the Benedictine Abbey of Montserrat, he exchanged his gentleman's clothes for a rough pilgrim's garb and dedicated his sword and dagger to the shrine of the Black Virgin. And for nearly a year, a little town called Mancera, 30 miles north of Barcelona, he gave himself to austerity, begging from door to door, wearing a girdle of barbed wire, fasting for days on end. For months he endured the terrible depressions of the mystic's dark night of the soul, even contemplating suicide at one point. But what followed was the mystic's singular reward, an immense breakthrough to spiritual enlightenment. In a wave of ecstatic, ecstatic illumination, one day at the river Condor, uh, Cardoner, uh, the wounded nobleman Ignatius Loyola became, in his words, another man. Loyola uh, reduced, re, I'm sorry, reduced his rebirth at Mansera to a plan for spiritual discipline a military manual for stormtroopers for the service of the Pope. Uh, the result was the Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, the greatest single force in Catholicism's campaign to recapture the spiritual domains seized from Protestantism. So most of us have heard of the Jesuits. The Jesuits is started with Ignatius Loyola, and just as it says here, their main goal was loyalty and service to the Pope and to take back 
what had been lost to the Protestant Reformation. So for weeks here, we've been talking about the Reformation taking hold in the Czech Republic and in Switzerland and in France and in England and all over Germany. And people were awakening to the fact that the Pope did not have authority over them and that the Scripture was, in fact, their authority. And the Pope was losing ground quickly and dramatically. And so Ignatius Loyola and his Jesuits began to retake this ground for the Pope. And this is called the Counter-Reformation, if you will. Because the it, we're, we're running two parallel tracks as we study here. What was going on with the Reformation and the, at the same time what is happening within the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, in order to reform it. Because all of these wild and terrible abuses that was happening from Rome did not go without notice by certain devout people within the Roman Catholic Church. And it had gotten so completely off the hook with its immorality and with its greed and with all these various other things that even those within the Catholic Church realized reform had to happen. So some historians have interpreted the Roman Catholic Reformation as a counterattack against Protestantism. Others have described it as a genuine revival of Catholic piety with few thoughts of Protestantism. The truth is uh, the moment was both a counter-reformation, as Protestants insist, and a Catholic Reformation, as Catholics argue. Its roots run back to forces before Luther's time, but its form, the form it took was largely determined by the Protestant attack. So there is a a, just a general reformation within the Catholic Church of saying we have gone so far outside the bounds that even the things that we're doing, even moral, secular people that don't even believe in God see these things as wrong. So we've got to rein it back in. But it's very different from the Protestant Reformation, as we'll see shortly. So one of the things that these reformers within the Catholic Church and a Luther, who, remember, started as a reformer in the Catholic Church because he was a Roman Catholic uh, monk and teacher of theology. And within the Roman Catholic Church, he was trying to change the Roman Catholic Church to begin with. That was what his 95 Theses were posted to uh, struggle against problems within the church as a Roman Catholic. And one of the things that he called for was a general church council, that there ought to be a bringing together of churches internationally from all over the known world to discuss these terrible abuses. But the Pope nor the kings would ever agree to it for a number of reasons. And one simple answer was politics. Emperor Charles V and the popes fought a running battle over the calling of a general council of churches that stretched for over 20 years. Luther had called for a council of the church as early as 1518. The idea gained the support of the German princes and the emperor, but the popes had fears of such an assembly. They remembered too well the councils at Constance and Basel, and they also knew that many in Germany had a mind uh, for a council without a pope. So if you remember the councils in Constance and Basel, those were the councils where they called, they reined in the craziness of three popes and reduced these warring three popes to one pope, and it was a pope that was nominated by the council. And if you remember back, what that does is it puts the council in authority over the pope. So the pope is constantly claiming absolute authority over everyone, but if a council put him in power, then he is, his power is beholden to the council. So the council actually has authority over him. So the Pope was unwilling to have a council come together because that meant that he had to listen to whatever the outcome of that council was. So Pope didn't want a council, and the kings didn't want a council because they were afraid it would upset the political power uh, that they had established. So nobody wanted a council. <clears throat> the Pope would rather deal directly with the kings because he was a king of sort, if you will, because he was so... Uh, powerful in his secular and political affairs. So no church council was called. And so since no church council is called, and we think back to the early days of the church councils, that was a place where they worked out heresies. What is wrong? What is evil? Where have we gone off track? And through the working of Christian people together, they were able to right wrongs, write statements to help get them back on track. But between the Pope and the kings, they wouldn't allow a council to happen, and things kept going off the rails for 20 or 30 more years, which is a whole generation. 
Well, uh, the popes and their secular power didn't change or didn't care at all about any reform until the uh, Pope Paul III. No serious reforms came until Pope Paul III ascended to the papal throne. Paul appeared to be uh, the most unlikely candidate for spiritual leadership. He had three illegitimate sons and one illegitimate daughter, a person who's supposed to be celibate. Um, four striking reminders of his pursuit of pleasure. The sack of Rome, so Rome was sacked under his leadership, however, seems to have sobered him, and he realized that the time had come for reform to begin in the house of God. And he started where he felt a change of heart was most urgently needed, and that was the College of Cardinals. And he appointed to the college a number of champions of reform. Among them were leaders of the Oratory of Divine Love, Saldeleto, Pole, and Carafa. Paul then appointed nine of the new cardinals to a reform commission. The head of the commission was another former member of the oratory, Gasparo Contarnini, a peacemaker by temperament. Contarnini stood for reconciliation with the Protestants and advocated a return to the faith of the apostles. After a wide-ranging study of considerations, in the Church of Rome, the commission issued a statement in 1537, a formal report, advice concerning the reform of the church. Well, disorder in the church, the report said, could be traced directly to the need for reform. The papal office was too secular. Imagine that. It cared way more about political things and money than it did about the soul. Both popes and cardinals needed to give more attention to spiritual matters and stop flirting with the world. Bribery in high places, abuses of indulgences. Uh, if you haven't been with us in the past, that is the paying of money for the forgiveness of sins. The um, evasions of church law, so nobody's even obeying the law that they have laid down. Prostitution in Rome. These and other offenses must cease. And so it was a statement of reform of sorts. But what do we have here? I want, to, I want to take some time here to compare this to what we have in the Protestant Reformation. In this council that comes together and puts out, I'm sorry, this committee that comes and puts out this statement of reform, the statement of reform that it puts out, pretty much any secular person that has any respect for the church whatsoever would agree with this. This is not a, a radical notion that someone who is the Pope who says they're a spiritual leader should actually care about spiritual things. That's not a radical reformation. Uh, the idea that we should not bribe legal officials, that we should actually obey the laws that we say are on the books, and that we should stop prostitution, uh, pretty much any generally moral person would agree with these things. These are barely reforms at all. It's really just a centering back to what any normal person would understand to be morality. That's how far off the church had gotten. But this was called a counter-reformation. But I would like to uh, compare this to what we have with Luther and other of the Protestant reformers, where they go and read the Bible and they see we are, we are radically far off. And so they start to completely challenge the entire underpinnings of the Roman Catholic Church. And they press all the way to the point of martyrdom to say we will obey the Bible. And as we looked just a moment ago, Ignatius Loyola, who's considered one of the most radical in the Counter-Reformation, his sworn allegiance was to the Pope, not to the Bible, not to Jesus Christ directly. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. But the thing that I think is in a biblical parallel of this, which is worth noting, is what we see in the, the progression of the kings in the Old Testament. Because most of the progression of the kings is a downward slide, very similar to what we see in the, in the uh, church history, where from the time of Christ, really from the time of Constantine downward, we have a downward slide, where we see some positive things, but mostly going negative. And with the kings in the Old Testament, we have the same thing. Some of them made some reform efforts, but there's a constant phrase in the, in the book of First and Second Kings when it deals with the kings. It'll say, and such and such king did good things and removed this and stopped this, but he let the high places remain, or but this, or but that. And so there was always one or two glaring things, things that were 
were forbidden of the Lord. If you did all kinds of reforms, but you allowed high places of idol worship to remain in Israel, what kind of reform was that really? Did it really help anybody? And the answer was no, because they removed certain things that were obviously wrong, but left things that were essentially misguiding the people. And it really wasn't until you get down to Josiah and characters like him where you see what true and total reform looks like when someone's heart is, is affected by the word of the Lord. So if you look at 2 Kings 22, and we get down to verse 11, this is where the, the, the word of the Lord has been lost. And they go to a temple renovation, and in the renovation of the temple, they find the scriptures again. I Imagine that, but that's where we were in the Middle Ages. People had completely lost sight of the scriptures. They pulled the scriptures out of the temple, and they dust it off, and it says in verse 11, When the king heard the words of the book of the law, because they actually read it to him, he tore his clothes, and the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahakam the son of Siphon, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Saphon the secretary, and Esaiah the king's servant, saying, Go, Inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So when Josiah heard the words of the Lord, he didn't just reform a little bit, and but basically leave all the idols in place and the stuff that made everybody happy. And, and made a cursory reform. He tore his clothes and said, what do we need to do to get back to exactly what the Lord has asked us to do? Because the Lord is going to be angry with us for not obeying his word. And we go on in chapters 22 and 23 and see how Josiah tore down everything and did everything he could possibly do to bring the people back to the Lord. And the Lord's judgment was forestalled or put off for a while because of his faithfulness in truly reforming. Reforming, again, is not a revolution, and that's something that's important in our day and age. A revolution is saying what was in the past was no good, so we got to trash that and create something new, something revolutionary. A reformation says that what we had in the past was right, and we've gotten off track, and we've got to go back to what we had. That's what a reformation is, and that's what we've been talking about for some weeks, and that's what Christians are always trying to do. Christians are, are reformers, always reforming, not revolutionaries. Revolutionaries want to get rid of the past and create something new in the future. And so uh, the reformers did the same thing that Josiah did here. They read the scriptures and rediscovered the scriptures and were passionate about doing everything that was in the scriptures. People like Ignatius Loyola and others like him were thir wanted to go back to the power that the popes had during the Middle Ages. They wanted to reclaim territory lost to Protestantism, and they were not nearly concerned with the scriptures or with the gospel of Jesus Christ, though they did reclaim some moral things. And as we turn back to a, a more moral Roman Catholicism, if you will, all the way down to our present day, people ask, well, you know, I, I know Catholics that are Christians, and I understand that. But my take on this, from basically from this point, from a somewhat Reformed Catholic Church to our present day, is that yes, there are Christians in the Catholic Church because they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. But I do not believe that you can be a faithful Roman Catholic and a faithful Christian. There's going to be a rub between the two, and we'll see that very specifically at the end of this chapter when we talk about the doctrines from the Council of Trent. If you are a good Christian, you're going to be a bad Catholic. And if you're a good Catholic, you're either not going to be a Christian or you're going to be a biblically divided and unfaithful Christian. And so they're somewhere on that spectrum. And that's why when you deal with a Roman Catholic friend or talk to a Roman Catholic friend, you have to ask them specific questions about what they believe about Jesus Christ and what they believe about salvation. Because even though they use the same terminology sometimes, they can mean radically different things by it. So that's a little bit on reform versus revolution versus what was going on in the counter-reformation. So let's keep moving on. Uh, all right, a little bit about um, the Council of Trent. So there was a, a calling, a seeking of a council for a long period of time, and it was put off and put off. But between two wars, 
two wars between Francis and Charles, the kings of uh, France and Germany, delayed the opening of a council until almost 1545, almost three decades after Luther's theses had appeared. By 1545, Rome was under the spell of a new austerity. Reform was on the rise. The immoralities of Paul's younger days were no longer acceptable behavior, and the Pope's new rigor was apparent in the institution of the Roman Inquisition and in the index of prohibited books, works that any Catholic risked damnation by reading. All the books of the Reformers were listed, as well as Protestant Bibles, and don't miss that, that the Bible, reading the Bible, was on the prohibited, even unto death list. For a long time, merely to possess one of these banned books in Spain was punishable by death. Having a Spanish Bible in your language, you can read it, punishable by death. Don't overlook that. The index was kept up to date until 1959 and was finally abolished by Pope Paul VI. I think this is one of the first references in this book that shows how something that happened then has extended all the way to our day. And you're going to start seeing that more and more and more. We today still feel the impact of things that are happening in these chapters that we're reading. Okay, Ignatius Loyola and the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. As a boy, Ignatius had left the gloomy castle of Loyola near the Pyrenees to enter the court of his father's noble friend, He had grown into little more than an engaging playboy, spending his days in military games or reading popular chivalrous novels, his knights pursuing less noble adventures with the local girls. But all that was before Ignatius met God at Mansurea, and Martin Luther emerged from his spiritual struggle convinced that the human will is enslaved and that man cannot save himself. God and God alone must deliver him, that is, justification by faith alone. Loyola came out of his struggles believing that both God and Satan are external to man, and man has the power to choose between them. By the discipline used of his imagination, man can strengthen his will so as to choose God and his ways. So, we choose God through our own strength. And as you'll see here later, we choose God by the power of our will, and that through our will, we can at some point reach perfection of our pursuit of God, according to Loyola. One of Loyola's spiritual exercises, for example, aimed to make the horrors of hell real. Quote, Here in imagination the shrieks and groans and the blasphemous shouts against Christ our Lord and all the saints. Smell in imagination the fumes of sulfur and the stench of filth and corruption. Taste in imagination all the bitterness of tears and melancholy and growing conscience. Feel in imagination the heart of the flames that play on and burn the souls. Uh, The same technique, of course, could be used to represent the beauties of the nativity or the glories of heaven. By proper discipline, the imagination could strengthen the will and teach it to cooperate with God's grace. So this, we continue to see this go on throughout church history. Uh, It really was It's always there at certain places, but it is the seeking of spiritual growth through the seeking of experience, and that's an important problematic progression. It's, I seek experience, and the experience leads me to God. That's very different than seeking after God through His Word and encountering God through His Word leading to experience. One is feelings and experiences leading you. The other is God's word leading you and experiences and feeling following after that. So an important difference in progression. For Ignatius, personally surrendering to God's will meant more education. He entered a school in Barcelona to sit with boys less than half his age to study Latin, then threw himself into a dizzying year of courses at the University of Alcala, Out of it came his uh, conviction that learning must be organized to be useful. The idea eventually grew into the Jesuits' famed plan of studies, which measured out heavy but manageable doses of classics, humanities, and sciences. Uh, And it's no coincidence from that that we have an American Catholic university that bears the name of Loyola and Francis Xavier, his uh, number one sidekick. Those that are systematic and organized in their efforts tend to last longer. All right, so 
Ignatius is following a path towards spiritual perfection, uh, pressed forward by the will. And in 1540, Pope Paul III approves this, at that time, little society of Jesus, the Jesuits, as a new religious order. In Ignatius' metaphor, they were to be chivalrous soldiers of Jesus, mobile, versatile, ready to go anywhere and perform any tasks the Pope assigned. And don't miss that. Like the Pope has not changed at this time. He's swearing allegiance to a guy that has four illegitimate children by various women. I, it's just it's a very strange thing for me. It's very, very hard for me to understand how people can do this. But this is what happened. And it's happened in various other false religions uh, throughout time. But they swear allegiance to the Pope to go be his soldiers. As a recognized order, they added to their earlier vows of poverty and chastity the traditional vow of obedience to their superiors and a fourth vow expressing their special loyalty to the Pope. They gave command to a superior general, in capital letters, because that was his title, elected for life, and their choice of the first general was, of course, Ignatius. So to enter this uh, Jesuit society, you make a vow of poverty, a vow of chastity, and a vow to obey your superior completely, and a vow to obey the Pope. So this is, a, this is why they call it a militant order. They're giving up everything, and they're following the direct commands of those above them without question. The aim of the order was simple, to restore the Roman Catholic Church to the position of spiritual power and worldly influence it had held three centuries before under Innocent III. Everything was subordinated to the Church of Rome because Ignatius believed firmly that the living Christ resided in the institutional church exclusively. Perhaps the most fascinating feature of the Jesuits was their perilous attempt to live energetically in the world without being of it. Loyola wanted them to be all things to all men, and they nearly succeeded. So they began sending missionaries all over the place. Um, Francis Xavier was the most famous of them. He went to India first and numerically was very um, successful. And then he went on to Japan and Southeast Asia, where he made more and more disciples uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. Where they were not taking hold was in the New World in America, which was mostly Protestant immigrants, uh, Maryland being one of the only places where Roman Catholic immigrants really took hold in the New World. But they were going uh, east while the Protestants were going west. Well, let's close out with the Council of Trent, because the Council of Trent was a fairly small council as the Council of Churches go, but it was a radically um, determinative council for the Roman Catholic Church all the way up into Vatican II in 1962. So what came out of the Council of Trent was uh, Roman Catholic official doctrine until 1962, and it wasn't changed a whole lot in 1962. And so what finally came out of a council of Roman Catholic churches was everything that the Protestant Reformation stood against, the, Pro the, the Council of Trent vigorously stood for. So it was a statement of faith counter to the Reformation in every way in order to divide the two from each other. The Protestant Reformers emphasized justification by faith alone, that we come to salvation, that we are justified or made right legally before God by faith alone in Christ alone. That's what the Reformers said, which they get from the Bible. The Council of Trent uh, insisted that Christian people must perform good works lest they become lazy and indifferent. And so salvation is made up by the grace of God and your good works. And without your good works, it's incomplete and is not saving. Luther, Calvin, and Grebel uh, stress salvation by grace alone. The Council of Trent emphasized grace and human cooperation with God to avoid, in Loyola's term, the poison that destroys freedom. So they don't, they don't understand how a person can be free and then not use that straight for the license of sin. It makes us think about Romans chapter 6. Uh, what shall I do with this freedom? Shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? No. But those who are true believers in Christ understand that we obey the Lord Jesus because we love him, not so that he will love us. And there's a huge difference between those two. But Trent is against grace alone. The Council of Trent, further on, is against Scripture, the authority of Scripture alone. 
The Council of Trent insisted on the supreme teaching of the office of the Roman Church, popes and bishops, as essential interpreters of the Bible. So individuals do not have the right to interpret the Bible. That the Pope and the bishops and the councils and the things that they write are canon and church law, that is what is truly authoritative because it's the only true and binding interpretation of the Scriptures. So they reject the authority of Scripture alone. The Council of Trent guaranteed that modern Roman Catholicism would be governed by the collaboration between God and man. So when people, there was a great, there are, there's always since then been a number of ecumenical movements, one not too long ago, where trying to bring together Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. We'll talk about this more in the future as we get to it, but it's going to be a big problem because these are irreconcilable differences. This is why they had to make, they had to call together a council and then write a statement to differentiate themselves from the Protestant reformers because they did not want to be associated with these people. And so when you have two different irreconcilable positions that have to do with the essential aspects of salvation, you have a problem. And you have to choose between one or the other. And as I've said many times, uh, and Clay and others have said in teaching here, the thing that we look at always is the authority of Scripture. Do you believe that the Pope and bishops are the only ones that can interpret the Scriptures and that it's right for them to say, uh, we're going we're gonna to burn the Bible so you can't read it? Or is it right for us to interpret the Scriptures for ourselves, read it for ourselves, love it, and then seek to obey the Lord because we love Him? Uh, obviously, you know where I stand on these things, and I hope this has been helpful to you as we progress forward in understanding that we have both a Reformation and an a Counter-Reformation going on in the Roman Catholic Church. We'll talk about more of both of these things in weeks to come. I hope you're doing well, and I will see you next time on Church History in Plain Language. Good night.